Right, so like you said, my name is John Shire. Uh, I work for a company called Detroit Labs in Detroit, Michigan, which is here, if you're unfamiliar with American geography. So, and this is rewriting Alamo Fire into the core, or how I took a popular framework and tore it apart and was barely able to put it back together. <laughs> So what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to do a brief intro to Alamofire's history, uh, a little bit of history of the development, uh, because it's very relevant to why we chose to rewrite some of the bits. Uh, I'm going to walk through why we chose to rewrite, how we did the rewrite, and do a little bit of a retrospective on the rewrite itself. So a little bit of Alamofire history. So June 2nd, 2014, the uh, Apple development world changed with the announcement of Swift. Um, Objective C without the C, which doesn't really make any sense anymore. And so just over two months later, Matt Thompson, who had previously written AF Networking, plus um, probably dozens of other open source projects at that time, uh, previewed Almafire at CocoConf Columbus, which I was lucky enough to attend. Uh, September 9th of that year, uh, Swift 1.0 ships, which was actually fairly different than the preview versions that Matt had been developing the uh, preview version of Alamo Fire on. And then, but two weeks later, uh, he was able to ship Alamo Fire 1.0. Now, Alamo Fire 1.0 was actually fairly primitive as far as networking libraries go, especially compared to AF networking. It was all in a single file. Uh, Matt was very proud of the fact that he could fit in into a single file that was just over a thousand lines long. Um, needless to say, that didn't last too long. However, it was missing several of the features that had uh, defined why people used AF networking. Things like uh, it was missing in certificate pinning, there was no retry feature, there was no request adapters, there was no result type. So the APIs were somewhat different than if you've used Alamofire uh, today. Uh, it was all a closure-based API. It was, you know, this was Swift 1.0, so this was, okay, what is the first version of Swift best practices. Well, everything's a closure. It's all closure practices. You know, uh, no more Objective-C blocks. It's a much simpler syntax so that you can, you know, it's, they're much easier to use. So everything was a closure. It had uh, what I call the subdelegate architecture, uh, which I'll go into in just a minute. Uh, but by version 1.3, uh, finally certificate pinning and multi-part encoding were added, which are two of the biggest features requested to be ported over from AF networking. Now, this subdelegate architecture that I mentioned briefly uh, is really the separation of the URL session delegate uh, methods into two sides, one of which would be the global URL session delegate, of which there is one, and then there would be the task delegate, which would implement all of the task delegate methods, and each one of those is created for every request, or Alamo Fire request, I should say. And so every time that you got a delegate callback, we had to find out what task delegate that that method should go back to and pass off all of the information. So there was this separation and a little bit of duplication. And as you'll see, that sort of separation and duplication led to problems later in Alamofire's development. So Alamofire 2.0, um, August 9th, 2015, finally separated the library into multiple files, um, added the result type, uh, for the first time, and Christian Noon takes maintainership because Matt was hired by Apple as a documentation writer. And uh, Matt has recently escaped the mothership and is now back to writing books and maintaining his websites, uh, and his hipster, swiftdoc.org, and a variety of other things. Uh, also, he does flight.school. So, uh, Alamo Fire 3.0, uh, October 10th, 2015. As you can see, there wasn't a lot of time between here because there was a little bit of a breaking API change that had to be added here. Um, this version added the various response types, or really in this one, just a response type to simplify, you know, conglomerate all of the response information that came back from the network request into one type. Uh, 3.2 added notifications and reachability checking. And then I joined the project right around that time as well. Uh, I was recruited by Christian because I was involved in the GitHub uh, issues forums and helped him discover the fact that there was a breaking issue that needed to be made for 3.0. Uh, 3.3 also added override closures for various delegate methods. This was kind of an awkward way to provide more escape hatches to developers in order to customize more behavior of URL session. Um, as we'll see, that led to a lot of complexity. So Alamofire 4.0 was released now almost two years ago uh, in 2016. So it was the biggest update yet. There were major renames because this was the time of Swift 3.0 and the great renaming. 
So everything had to change. We redid a lot of the APIs to match better what the naming conventions were for um, Swift APIs. Uh, automatic retry and request adaptation was added. Um, yeah, we, we did the major transition there. We tried to drop iOS 8 support, but uh, people were forking the library and doing their own unofficial iOS 8 branch, which was rather dangerous because they didn't port back the bug fixes or security changes that we had done. So that was a little bit awkward there. But the current release um, actually is 4.7.3 and supports Swift uh, 3.0 to 4.2, iOS 8 and above, iOS 10.10, or macOS 10.10 10 and above, as well as tvOS, watchOS, uh, but there is no Linux support. So why did we decide to rewrite this library? It was very successful. We have hundreds of thousands of apps using it. Um, how many of you have used Alamo Fire in the past? So you can see there's quite a few people here that have used the library as well. So, but why rewrite something so successful? Well, Swift has changed a lot. Uh, even just in the beta period when Swift was initially undergoing development, it had changed. It changed from one to two, two to three especially. So there were a lot of things that we needed to do with the library that hadn't been done. Uh, we needed to catch up with the language. So we needed to adopt uh, throw and catch for error handling. You know, previously we had this result type and it was what was used always to encapsulate the error handling behaviors of the library. But as you can see with this uh, method from the serialize uh, requirement for our response serializers, previously it required the user to return a result type. Um, but we really don't want the user to have to care that there's a result type except for maybe the one time that they need to, which is when they're parsing responses and things like that. So by updating the protocol to instead just require a throwing function here and returning the object directly if it's successful, it makes it match much better with the rest of Swift that users are uh, familiar with and allows them to uh, more easily use the different features of the library. We also wanted to add Linux support at some point, but unfortunately, the amount of Objective-C wrangling that had to go into the initial versions of Alamofire were still there because of various reasons and requirements. So um, the, any Objective-C involvement that we had made porting to Linux very difficult, where if we wanted to do so, we would have to duplicate types entirely to no longer use Objective-C features, which just wasn't maintainable. Uh, and Swift's automatic Objective-C integration has been greatly reduced. There's no longer you know, Objective-C synthesis of certain methods. Um, things aren't automatically exposed. Things don't necessarily use Objective-C paradigms anymore. And so now with the newer versions of the language, we can remove a lot of this Objective-C integration. And as an example, one of the things that we had at the fundamental core of the library was this custom response to selector implementation mainly so that we could offer closures to override these features, but if you didn't set a closure, we could tell the delegate dynamically that we don't respond to the selector, and so URL session would do whatever its default behavior was automatically. Uh, unfortunately, this entire pit, beat, uh, bit of code was completely unusable from Linux, so when we wanted to port over, things like this created a lot of friction. Another reason we wanted to rewrite is because the frameworks themselves have moved on. There have been additions to the URL session APIs that we don't fully use right now. Uh, in addition, uh, I especially gained insight into how URL session works and how all of the delegate callbacks work. One example of this is that you can have authentication challenges both at the URL session delegate level and the URL session task delegate level. But if you implement those methods at either or both, the behavior of what happened or when that method gets called changes. So if both are implemented, only the URL session delegate method gets called for certificate challenges, which is how we implement certificate pinning. But this meant that all of our challenges were at a session level, which meant we couldn't tell which task was prompting for the session or for the certificate challenge, which led to the fact that our only action there was to cancel the task, which led to a very poor experience. And the cancellation of that task for certificate pinning looked very similar to cancellation for other reasons. Uh, but now that we've realized that implementing it only on the URL session task delegate side meant that we could tie it directly to a task, means that in the newer versions of, or the new version of Alamo Fire I'm going to be talking about, that we can get per task errors for uh, certificate pinning, which also means that we can then take that error and expand it out into offering and exposing all of the information that comes back from Apple security framework. So you can get more detail about why a pinning failed. 
In addition to uh, the framework's URL session, we also gained better understanding of Grand Central Dispatch. Um, in addition to the fact that the uh, Swift version of the framework uh, for this has a little bit of a difference to the Objective-C version, it's also a realization of the difference between concurrency and parallelism. And concurrency is just the fact that you trigger actions at the same time, they aren't necessarily processed at the same time. Whereas parallelism, you can trigger them at the same time and they're processed at the same time, perhaps on separate queues or threads and things like that. But this isn't really necessary for a lot of the things that we were doing, but it was creating a lot of complexity underneath the library. And so this was leading to a lot of bugs. In addition to this, the new thread, uh, thread sanitizer that's been around since I believe Xcode 9 uh, has allowed us to re-engineer Alamofire to be thread safe from the beginning. So all of our development, all of our testing is now done running the thread sanitizer so that we can tell ahead of time uh, if we have any threading issues. And that's one of the biggest other reasons why we decided to rewrite is because of all the bugs that would come out of the library. And these were just over the years users would notice various threading issues. Um, race conditions were very subtle and hard to find, but we had some basic thread safety issues. One of the first bugs filed on Alamo Fire after it was released was the fact that that subdelegate architecture wasn't thread safe, and so they had to add a separate queue to keep things in sync. As an aside, this is essentially how queues work in Alamo Fire 4.7 and below right now. Um, there's the main queue that you would create a request on. The URL sessions delegate queue that we would use would have its own queue. The request itself would have its own delegate queue, so every request you created would create its own dispatch queue. And if you needed to use retry or some of the other features, it would call out to a global queue to do its asynchronous retry work and then back into your queue. This led to a lot of queue hopping and issues like, well, I created 10,000 requests at a time in my app hung. Well, okay, maybe don't do that, but we should probably not provide the foot guns necessary to freeze an app like that if users do try to enqueue 10,000 requests all at once. Uh, another reason that we needed to do the rewrite for the bugs is that we had several examples of poorly designed or easy to misuse APIs. How many of you have you used the multi-part form encoding APIs for Alamofire? A few, uh, I'm sorry. Um, both for the API that's in here and also the fact that you are working with a server that requires multi-part form encoding. But as you can see here, we tried to use the same sort of upload API that had been familiar to users that, you know, you can upload a file or just plain data. But since a multi-part request requires you to, say, perhaps encode multiple different files, uh, it was initially designed to be asynchronous, but the request pipeline in Alamofire wasn't asynchronous in the first place. So. Instead of the normal response that you get, uh, instead what would happen is you would encode the multi-part request, it would have an asynchronous like encoding completion handler, and then that's where you would do your normal request handling that you would use like you would the rest of Alamofire. And so unfortunately that led to a very bad user experience. It was very easy to misuse. Users didn't understand why this was different. And with the rewrite, we were able to make the entire request encoding pipeline asynchronous, so now multi-part encoding becomes just normal usage. So the complexity of Alamofire as it grew and as it added more features became quite clear that it was making bugs harder to find and deal with because things were separated between different sections. Um, bits of code that may affect the request lived both in the session delegate and in the task delegate and in the request itself. Uh, I've been on the project over two years, and every time I came back to the code base, I still had to relearn how the subdelegate architecture worked and how retry worked, because there were so many different pieces that were being touched by those APIs that every time I needed to debug it, I needed to retrace all of the different points that it touched. So obviously, making that simpler would go a long way towards helping maintainability. And there were various race conditions lurking in the code base, even up to today where there were fundamentally how things were triggered in one part to another that there was really no way to easily synchronize. We would have had to fundamentally break things to be able to synchronize two different classes and their actions. So that was one of the other things. And of course, the rewrite should help us. You know, even if we wanted to fix all of these bugs and other architectural issues, another goal with the rewrite was to enable us to write more features.
Um, like I said, the unique errors for certificate pinning and cancellation, so that users can tell the difference between pinning cancellations, manual cancellations, and the cancellation that happens when your, you know, ultimately your URL session goes, gets de-inited. Um, we wanted to add more per request features so that you could customize on a per request basis things like retry and ad adaptation. And we also wanted to add event monitoring. One of the biggest complaints about Alamo Fire was that there was no built-in logging. And so event monitoring would help, you know, users add their own logging over time. But because of the complexity of the previous architecture, there was no clean way to add such a feature. So how did we go about the rewrite? Well, the first thing that we did was to simplify the framework altogether. We removed some of the features. Um, Alamo Fire 4 does support the URL session stream task APIs, but they were never tested and we've never had any reported issues. So it seems unlikely anyone's actually using that API from us, so we got rid of it. Uh, the closure API itself was a huge source of complexity of a whole bunch of optional closures that makes it difficult to, you know, sometimes we either call the closure, we call our default behavior or something like that. Um, so we found that it was much simpler to remove those APIs as optional properties, say on a session manager or a session delegate, and instead move it into what I call the closure event monitor, which is just an event monitor that has all of those properties for you that you can just go in and set the closures. And so that feature got moved into a completely separate implementation. And so we also needed to rethink some of the implementations with what we know now. Um, where things live in the APIs, redesign, maybe simplify, some stuff like that. So one of these things that we had to rethink is how we used queues. So at uh, WWDC 2017, there was a good session called Modernizing Grand Central Dispatch Usage. And this is a brilliant session that seemed almost targeted towards Alamofire and how we used queues, where instead of creating a separate queue for every request that we make now, the session manager will have a root queue, which is the basis of the queues for everything else that happens within the library. So the URL sessions delegate queue is set to this queue, and the request queue itself that each request has is now set to this queue as well. And so what this means is that in its simplest mode, there's only one queue no matter how many requests that you enqueue at the same time. And this helps simplify and reduce the load on the system so that instead of having 10,000 queues if you enqueued 10,000 requests, Instead, all you're doing is creating 10,000 queues that instead point to the same queue, which is much less uh, resource intensive on the system. So one of the other things we took the uh, opportunity to do was some core refactors of our top level APIs. Some of the protocols that we observe now, instead of doing things like result or force unwrapping, which is one of the changes that we had made in uh, Alamo Fire 4, instead turn to throwing functions or methods. So that instead of having to um, create a result or have the risk of a force unwrap crashing your app, uh, you can safely capture whatever errors come through there. Um, in Alamo Fire 5, the response serialization, multi-part form data, and certificate pinning have all been updated now to use the throwing functions instead. One of the other things, which is sort of a byproduct of what we were doing, was that there were a few patterns that we were able to use from the, the refactoring book. Uh, this is a very popular book. In fact, its website is out there and puts most of its content on the website, so I don't even know if you need to buy the book. Um, but one of the things that we did do are things like uh, change a unidirectional to a bidirectional relationship. And one of the things that this does is, previously we were able to map from a task to a request, but we also needed sometimes to map from a request to a task. And so by creating a type that could encapsulate that bidirectional relationship, we can move all of the logic that previously was a separate value and at two different points was maintaining the mapping into one that can now uh, maintain the mapping for us and say automatically nil out the opposite relationship when things go away. One of the other refactors that we did uh, that would be named from the book is something called preserve whole object or introduce parameter object. And this is extremely critical for retry. So in Almafire right now, when you create a request, we immediately synchronously turn the uh, protocol version of that request into an actual concrete URL request and then pass that along to be used by the rest of Almafire. 
Um, this worked, and it was simple for the uh, synchronous request, but it meant that in retry scenarios that you lost that initial, say, protocol abstraction that you had before. You were left with only the URL request that was initially there. So there were some bits of that request pipeline that you weren't able to actually retry. And it also meant that you lost all of the different bits that you had sent in here. So what we can do now is preserve the whole object, as it says. So now, instead of immediately converting into a URL request, we capture all of the parameters you pass in and have that value be the one that is eventually and asynchronously converted into a URL request for you. And what this allows you to do is that if the request fails, retry can now capture this step as well. So if, for some reason, your um, conversion from separate URL method parameters coding and headers failed to be converted into a URL request, uh, you can retry that, perhaps uh, fix something at runtime, or at the very least, you'll be able to capture that error and see why your request failed. We've also re-implemented, and this is the core of the rewrite, the fundamental classes of Alamofire. So the session manager, which wraps a URL session, the session delegate, which handles all of the URL session delegate methods, including now all of the task delegate methods, and the request types themselves, have been completely rewritten from the ground up. Now, we could have taken a more piecemeal approach to, say, swap out one method at a time, but the complexity of those changes uh, and the fact that I could spend as much time as I wanted on it led us to believe that just redoing the types themselves would uh, reveal to us what the actual requirements for them are rather than having to move one bit at a time. So we simplified them down to exactly what needs to happen. The session handles the session, the session delegate handles the session delegate, and the request handles all the results of the request. Uh, we've removed the subdelegate architecture. So internally, the library is much simpler. Um, there was a lot of code removal that was done there, and it allows us to uh, now uh, have a new foundation on which to evolve the library. And this also gave us the opportunity to create new API. So the previous closure-based API was useful, but it added complexity and wasn't flexible. So the new event monitor protocol that I mentioned allows you to capture 36 different events within Alamofire. Um, this includes all of the session and task delegate methods that come back so that you can see when all of those methods are called. Uh, it gives you all of the lifetime events of a request so that you can see when it started, when it stopped, when it got data, when it failed, when it was canceled, all of those things. And this event monitor protocol allows us now to re-implement core features of Alamo Fire in a very removed way. So say our notifications, uh, which would be triggered through NS Notification Center, similar to if you're familiar with AF Networking, the notifications that were available through that library. Previously, these notifications were triggered directly by events within a request or even outside of the request. So they were spread all over the place. Instead, now all we have is you know, the Alamo Fire notification monitor that has certain events that it needs to send notification for. It implements those protocol methods. It can then send the notifications it needs and encapsulate the data that goes along with it. And so this sort of API gives a huge boost in productivity to users to add their own logging merely by implementing their own, say, logging event handler, put in exactly the methods that they need using whatever logging framework or even just print, and uh, pass it into Alamofire when they create the session manager. And so these sorts of new APIs uh, are going to be a core part of what Alamofire 5 actually gives you. So I have a few minutes left to sort of go through the retrospective here of the difficulties and surprises that we'd run into. So fundamentally, async is hard. Uh, it's hard to think about. It's hard to reason about. Well, it's why the uh, thread sanitizer is such a key boost in productivity. Because then if you're running this thread sanitizer, you don't necessarily have to worry about uh, thinking ahead of time exactly which threads have to access which things. Maybe you need a lock here. Maybe you don't. The thread sanitizer can tell you exactly when things happen. And because of our already existing extensive testing, uh, our, all the tests that we had already written, every time that we ran those tests with the thread sanitizer, we could verify that all of the previous use cases were, in fact, thread safe now. Uh, and the simpler queuing that we came up with, in fact, greatly reduced the complexity, even though that's, it was still hard to reason about. And, Realizing the concurrency versus parallelism difference was also a key part of that, that we could enqueue hundreds of requests onto the same queue, 
And it would still work out fine, and it would still be performant, even though they are all operating on the same core serial queue. Um, and Almafire has a lot of features and expected behavior, but luckily our extensive tests helped us. Uh, as we would make changes, I would just basically comment out or even deactivate entire test files. And as I was re-implementing the request APIs that touch different things, re-enable those tests, rerun them, see maybe what changes might need to be made to uh, to fix them and uh, run them again. So that allowed us to very easily evolve the library as we were building the rewrite. So there were a few surprises along the way. Uh, if you've implemented your own download task delegate, you'll recognize this method, download task did finish downloading to, which provides you the URL that it downloaded a file to. Um, its documentation actually states, because this file is temporary, you must either open the file for reading or move it to a permanent location in your app sandbox container directory before returning from this delegate method. Somehow, previous versions of Alamofire did not fall afoul of this rule. We would see that the delegate method got called back and immediately call out to a separate queue for our request to handle the fact that that URL was now there and the file was there. And I, I believe right now that this delegate method works by enqueuing right after it calls this method a block operation that in fact runs the file deletion. And so I think what was happening was that by going to a separate queue, we were starving the previous queue of a thread. And so that deletion wouldn't actually run until the other queue had actually completed its work. And so that allowed people who were downloading files and immediately parsing them to not have to move the file themselves. But now, since the queue was unified between all of the requests inside of Alamofire, it meant that that operation was able to run immediately, and we were having all of our download parsing tests fail because that file was immediately deleted right after it was downloaded. So that was an interesting thing to try and figure out what was happening there, but um, it just meant that we had to move it ourselves. So we just perpend Alamofire to the name of the temporary file and put it aside so that the users can use it later. And so this was a very surprising issue that came up, possibly because we were benefiting from a race condition in the first version of the code. And so all, even with the thread sanitizer, because the thread sanitizer won't tell you about threading issues inside of Apple's code. So it's, it's key to know that you know, there can still be some things that happen behind the scenes that you may not be aware of. So when should you rewrite? Well, when you can pay the cost, because rewrites are more expensive than developing an app, or you know, than refactoring, usually. So you know, Almafire is just my free time, so I can spend as much or as little on it as I want. So I've been developing this sort of rewrite and new version of Almafire over the last almost year now, as I've, you know, OK, what do I want to do? Well, I want to figure out what happens when all of these delegate methods are called. And so I can spend my time to do that. But it's not something that can always happen. It just depends if you can handle the cost. And also, a rewrite is bigger than a refactor. So if you can handle the size, then perhaps it's possible. But a rewrite plus current development is probably about as much effort, or a refactor plus active development on an app is probably about as much effort as a rewrite altogether. So if you're going to spend your time rewriting, you're probably not going to be able to develop new features or things like that. So, or you would have to add more resources to a project in order to rewrite bits of it. But really, there's so many factors and variables that go into this that I'm not really going to give you a good answer to this. So would I do this again? Uh, probably. Uh, until the PR was up, uh, I wasn't really sure that it would work. There was so much, you know, I wasn't sure that a single, deli or a single queue would work. We'd never done it like that before. We're always taught that it's better to do things in parallel if you can than it is to have everything operating on a single queue. Um, now that it's been merged, the whole thing will pay off because all of the features and the capabilities that it's unlocked are available for us to keep building upon. And if it hadn't worked, well, a lot of work would have been thrown away, but I think I would have learned a lot anyway. So it can be valuable in that way, but if it's your job, I don't know if your boss would be really pleased with, well, I learned a lot, uh, even if I had to throw three months of work away. So that's all I have. You can try out the Alamo Fire 5 branch now. Uh, we're trying to, trying to get development done at some point, um, hopefully perhaps sometimes after iOS 12 and the new versions of the OSs are released. As you can see, it was a very large PR, so uh, I am 
on Twitter and GitHub as well. Any questions? Yes. Did you increase the test coverage or add any interests? Some of it was added, yeah, because we did create the new features and things like that. Um, we weren't really tracking test coverage as a metric. Uh, it was mostly to ensure that various cases that we come up with are actually executed as tests. So uh, a lot of tests were removed because there were the features that we removed uh, no longer needed to be tested. Uh, we also removed things like the property list serializers that I don't think anyone ever used. So all of those tests went away. But we did add tests for things like the, the new errors for certificate pinning and cancellation uh, and some of the things like that. But a lot of it was just changing the existing tests that we had into uh, handling the new expectations and things like that. Yes? Uh, are you still happy with your choice to rip out results and go with throws? Yes, because uh, we didn't really rip out result. Result is still there as, you know, when you get a response, you can have the result of that response because it's asynchronous work and throws doesn't really work with that. Um, but we did rip it out of all of our top level APIs that are exposed to users, like our response serialization and things like that. And when we need to internally, we actually do wrap your, say, throwing serialization method inside of a result. And so internally, we're still using a result for all of those things. So it simplifies all of the logic that, you know, all of the things that result gives you as far as simplified handling and stuff is still there. It's just no longer exposed to the user. They don't need to care that we use uh, a result. They can just implement the standard throwing functions that they're used to with, uh, with uh, Swift in general. Anything else? All right, well, we have a forum on the Swift forums now. So if you need to know how to better use Alamofire's features, uh, you can find us there. If you want to report a bug, feel free to open an issue on GitHub. And we always welcome PRs, because it's just me and Christian right now. So, all right, thanks.